Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar. We've had a bit of a hiatus for the last month or so uh, from our monthly webinar series, but we're back and we're very excited to host Anthony Cho uh, today. Uh, he, Anthony and I have gotten to know each other over the pandemic year, I would say, uh, and uh, there, there's very few months that go by that somebody doesn't mention hey have you chat with anthony about what you guys are doing I'm very it's always exciting to kind of hear about some of the work that gets done at uh, provenance capital uh, but we'll chat more about that uh let's get started so um before before we get started i do want to do quick introductions uh so a anthony maybe i'll have you do a quick introduction about yourself and then and, and provenance and then jump into a little bit about, about myself as well uh, but uh, for everybody who doesn't uh, know me, my name is Ahmad Hassan, co-founder and CEO at Retina. Uh, we are a B2B SaaS platform that predicts at the individual customer ID level lifetime value. And I'll chat a little bit more about that. My background uh, and how I got into all of this is uh, first half of my career, I spent building autopilots for helicopters and satellites. Really was excited about that kind of stuff. But what got me even more excited is bringing some of that technology over to the business world. I got to spend some time at PayPal and Facebook where I got to do a ton of customer level analytics at PayPal and then got to see how some of the issues around customer acquisition are not really being dealt with. And that's how Retina came about. Um, and, that, and, and now for the last uh, several years, we've been really focused on this uh, problem of customer acquisition and optimizing that uh, using customer lifetime value, we've found that there are several use cases of customer lifetime value that have uh, that have come up that are that go beyond the acquisition use case as well, and we'll chat about some of that today as well. Uh, but today, I'm excited to have Anthony here. Anthony is the founding partner of uh, Provenance Capital. Uh, he's a veteran private equity investor, been doing this for over 20 years, uh, and what's been exciting about what as I've gotten to know him is that his experience in the direct to consumer business is uh, unparalleled. Like if you ever just want to have an insightful conversation about all the different nuances of DTC businesses, it seems like he's seen it all. He's worked closely with brands across multiple categories, provenance, uh, you know, as a, you know, they, 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 they have brands like Dagny Dover, uh, MeUndies recently, he's very excited to see some of the brands that are, that, that you now represent. Uh, but with that, let me first uh, hand it over to you. Maybe you can give a quick background about yourself and a little bit about provenance, and then uh, we'll dive into the uh, some of the agenda for today. Sure. <clears throat> Appreciate that, uh, Ahmad. So um, I started my career in uh, uh, private equity focused on consumer about 25 years ago um, and started doing uh, some version of direct consumer investing uh, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, have been a passionate uh, follower of uh, what's been going on with uh, consumer uh, and especially on the data side uh, ever since. And so uh, it's been super fun. Um, uh, launched Provenance in uh, 2017, uh, really with the view that uh, we're going to focus on the growth stage of consumer. That means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but uh, to us, Typically, we're focused on companies that are uh, somewhere between 25 to 75 million of revenue, still growing rapidly, um, inflecting into some version of profitability, um, and trying to make all those trade-offs. So, um, so what we're doing a little bit differently is uh, using uh, data and analytics to really help inform not just our investment decision but really to, you know, in tandem with the companies that we partner with uh, to really help shape the strategies of the company around the core customer. So, uh, so it's been, uh, it's been a fun ride. Uh, it continues to be uh, interesting and, um, and consumer is always a fun place for me because it's always dynamic. Uh, it's changing just enough every year to keep you on your toes and keep it interesting. So, um, so uh, that's why I've never gotten bored doing consumer. I can imagine the, the pandemic year also has been a very fascinating year because it's changed a lot of the consumer behavior and uh, it, it's probably made it even more exciting. Yeah, so I'm never a huge fan of, you know, assigning uh, letter shapes to the, the impact on uh, <laughs> different sectors. But whoever coined the, 
the K-shaped dynamic, uh, you know, saw that in spades. Certain. What's certain the K-shaped dynamic? I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, some some categories inflected yeah. upwards, and some categories inflected downwards. Um, yeah. But it's also fun to watch. Uh, you know what's happening while. Uh, we're we're entering this this period of uh, normalization. As normalization, well. exactly, exactly. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get started. So uh, here's uh, for for every for those who've been uh, attending our webinars. Our format is slightly different. We want to not have this webinar be us just chatting about stuff between me and Anthony. We want it to be a very interactive webinar. I've actually in the past been known for calling out participants to ask questions. I'm not going to do that, uh, but I would highly encourage everybody to uh, come up with questions and share them in the chat or the Q&A section. Um, would love to, and the format will be, we're going to pick these four topics. We're going to kick it off with like one or two statements uh, from our perspective, but then really would encourage you guys to suggest some questions uh, that we, that, that help you get uh, involved in the in the conversation. We're going to try to spend no more than 10 minutes on each one of the topics if possible and then we want to make sure that we'll leave some more time for general Q&A at the very end and try to wrap it up by no later than 11.50 uh, so, so we can get you guys out of here in time as well. Um, but let's start with uh, some of the topics that we'll cover today. So I want to I want to kick it off with just Anthony, how you think about evaluating investment opportunities. We'll cover that for the first 10 minutes or so. Um, the second topic uh, we want to we want to cover: How can companies prepare for potential capital raises or M&A conversations when it comes to data and metrics? And then uh, we have a couple of other topics we could jump into: channel diversification and the importance of metrics in e-commerce. Uh, depending on how much time we have, uh, we'll, we might just narrow it to three topics but if you have extra time we'll we'll cover all four topics um with that why don't we why don't we jump into the first one i want to i'm really curious and we had a little bit of a conversation in preparation for this webinar on how provenance evaluates investment opportunities and what you what you do differently uh maybe uh anthony you can you can kick it off and then i'll i'll have a probably a couple of questions yeah yeah for sure uh so um so for us, we are very brand focused. And so uh, when we think about uh, making investments, we, we almost try to treat each company uh, uh, as almost like an organic entity. And the analogy there is for us, the, the brand is kind of the, the DNA uh, uh, of that organism. But, you know, what that DNA ultimately produces and how it gets uh, embodied and realized you know, you really start to see that through the customer asset. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of different ways about uh, couching that. We talk about the quantitative and the qualitative uh, together. Sometimes we refer to that as the magic and the logic. Um, but uh, when we're really evaluating brands, we're really trying to get to the, the root of, A, what we think that brand DNA is and how that's embodied in the, the customer asset. And... For us, you know, we start with uh, we call digitally intensive brands, um, and we do that because uh, digitally intensive brands are sitting on a mountain of information. And our our goal through our analytics process is to, you know, uh, help unlock some of the insights that come out of uh, what's happening at uh, at a customer level, and help try to turn that into a strategic game plan for the business. So. We don't have a one size fits all strategy that we think all companies uh, should follow. We very much believe that everybody has a custom playbook that's best suited for them based on uh, who, who their core audience is and what their behavior is. So, uh, but for us at the root of it, you know, we've started with analytics because, um, you know, in today's world, the customer is the asset. And with predictive analytics, you can now really, you know, depict the shape of that customer asset depreciation curve. And, you know, it's, I think it's been confounded by uh, a lot of conversations because, you know, this is an asset that doesn't sit on the balance sheet. You know, it's, you see the reflection of it in the P&L, but um, most people don't treat it like an asset, but, 
just like in any other asset intensive business, you're going to see that you have to be pretty disciplined about the ROI decisions you're, you're making based on the shape of that curve um, and what that looks like. So, uh, so a lot of that, you know, uh, you know, comes to life as uh, what people commonly refer to as cohort analysis. Um, but the cohort analysis to us is the what. That's what is happening. But we also like to engage in a deep amount of customer segmentation to get to the root of the why. Why does the, the shape of that curve look the way it does? Uh, whether it's, um, you know, whether you're looking at it as a retention curve or a customer lifetime value curve, uh, getting to the why is, is where the, the magic really starts to happen. So um, I'll pause there and see if, uh, see if I can uh, clarify any, any further parts of that. Yeah, and while people share their questions, I wanna, you know, one of the things I found fascinating is anyone who you decide to even explore a partnership with uh, that we've got, came, come across, uh, it seems like there's a lot of value add, uh, even in the exploration phase where you're helping brands look at their customer base in generally a different light, but also being able to think about the customer segmentation. And I've, I've kind of found that fascinating. Uh, what, what got you guys to kind of think about that approach and, you know, this customer segmentation going beyond um, just the first party data that you, that they might already have? Uh, how do you guys get started with that? And what's a typical partnership look like, partnership process look like for you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll take the, uh, the first part of that question, uh, then address the, uh, the partnership part of it as a result of it. So um, the, the root of why we do what we do is, um, you know, a, a while back, I can't, I can't pin the year, uh, but over 10 years ago, started to see this dynamic play out and have only seen it play out more uh, now that we've ha had this uh, very data intensive approach. But most people don't realize they don't have something that is an average customer. And in traditional e-commerce metrics that people are looking at, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at traffic and conversion and AOV and things of that nature, uh, lots of times you'll see that it looks like there's an average customer behavior. But when you really drill down uh, to the individual level, you'll realize that you have no such thing as an average customer. If you have anything resembling customer loyalty, what you'll find is that there's something resembling a Pareto principle at play um, in your business where, you know, call it 20% of your customers are generating 65% of your revenue and uh, maybe three quarters of the contribution of the business. And to us, that's the definition of your core customer. And once you layer upon that, you know, what that psychographic tribe of that consumer looks like, then you really start to get to the heart of who your core customer is, what, uh, what community your brand is built off of, and in my view, then and only then can you really shape what the, the go forward optimal strategy for a, a business should be, regardless of what channel you're talking about. Certainly it applies to digital, but if you've got physical retail or if you've got wholesale partners, <clears throat> um, all this comes down to uh, the optimal strategy for a company should always be built around its core customer. So <clears throat> we like to start with that conversation, that analytics process, and have it be a dialogue with the companies that we're talking to. Um, so if companies give us access to their data, um, we like to share it back with the company and have a conversation about what it is that we're seeing. And uh, our philosophy is <clears throat> uh, if we're aligned about what to do with that information from there, then and only then should we consider uh, a partnership together. Because if, we, if we're not aligned about strategy, then to me, it doesn't matter what the valuation, the structure, the governance, any of those other deal metrics are. Because uh, if you're not aligned about where you're trying to go, you just shouldn't be partners. So yeah. for us, it's a very collaborative approach where we're saying, here's the data that we're seeing, here's what it implies to us, um, here's kind of a, a high level sketch of what a strategy might look like, but let's have a conversation about uh, the puts and calls of that. And 
once we determine that there's alignment there, then um, then uh, it sets itself up to, to be a pretty strong partnership from there. That's awesome. Uh, well, I think this is a very relevant next question from Alyssa. Uh, and we'll probably cover what units to measure, but like what uh, customer data do you do you review? Like what data do you typically ask for? So uh, most of the people that we talk to, I'd say, you know, probably 80% plus uh, of the people we talk to are on Shopify. So we can do what we want to do with basically five columns of output on Shopify data. And it's, it's your transaction log and customer file is really what it is. <clears throat> uh, the more data you share with us, uh, if, it, if it goes down to the product level, we can do more with that. <clears throat> the more you give us, the more we can do. Uh, but the, the bare minimum we usually ask for is, um, you know, pretty standard Shopify output of five columns of data, and we can, we can do a lot with that. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's get into it in terms of um, what, what we, you know, how can companies best prepare for any of these partnership conversations and um, how to get started. So a few things that we talked about is you, you already mentioned segmenting customers and the five columns you mentioned don't necessarily remind me of like the kind of segmentation you talked about, which might be uh, the those five columns can give you a lot of RFM type segmentation, but not necessarily demographic behavior or, or psychographic type segmentation. Uh, so maybe let's jump into thinking about how do you how do you do that? Yeah, so <clears throat> what we do is uh, w once we uh, have access to your, your customer data, we can then layer on external data on top, uh, demographic and psychographic characteristics. There's a, there's a lot of different databases uh, we've used uh, historically. Uh, without boring everybody in, into a great level of detail, like if we wanted to, we could layer on whether you have air conditioning in your house, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. Um, most of the, the, we've drilled it down to a select handful of variables that we think really matter in uh, defining who your, your tribe of consumers are. So <clears throat> we, we try to marry the quantitative uh, piece with the analytics as well as the, the demographic and psychographic piece. And the reason why we do that is that you know, I certainly saw this earlier in my career directionally, but now we can see it very granularly where not everyone in the U.S. is a potential customer for you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's very much a part of our macro thesis that we think, you know, um, the, the world is in a permanent state of brand fragmentation where consumers have virtually unlimited choice on uh, what brand they want to, to uh, you know, put their emotional energy behind. And <clears throat> they're gonna end up purchasing from brands that most closely align with their value system. And in many ways, those are almost human characteristics. You know, how does a brand talk to me? Uh, does it have a sense of humor or is it really serious and professional? Um, is it progressive leaning uh, or is it more conservative? All kinds of different things that are almost human characteristics around how you would select your friends is how people are uh, making brand choice. So um, that's why we layer on all this data as well, just to understand who, again, it's with the goal of understanding who that core customer truly is. So <clears throat> uh, that's, that's a big part of the segmentation exercise we like to, to look into. So um, without naming any names, uh, you know, one of our portfolio companies, uh, when we did the, the diligence for them, we showed them that out of 71 different psychographic types in the US, four of them had a 10x propensity to buy from the brand and accounted for 50% of the value creation in the business. And when we showed them this, uh, their faces went white <laughs> at the beginning. It, it was terrifying because it sounds like you've got a really limited audience. And what we said was, no, actually, it's quite the opposite. What it's saying is uh, these are the best consumers in the U.S. Um, they have the, 
you know, the most brand choice available to them and they're leaning strongly into your brand. So it actually says quite a bit about what your brand is, but what it also means is we need to have a very focused strategy on how, how we're continuing to do branding, um, how, how we want to attack different channels. And it doesn't mean our strategy should be everywhere to everyone. It should be very focused. So um, that's where customer segmentation really comes to life for us is that uh, with this data, we can advise companies with uh, a level of precision that uh, just wasn't possible 10 years ago. And yeah, it reminds me of, um, so one of the activities at Retno that I got a chance to do last year was speak with a lot of companies that help with M&A and this is investment banks, private equity firms. And what was really apparent to me, what you one of the things you mentioned earlier is that they all go through a lot of diligence and they, they, they will look at even things like earnings reports from a very granular lens. And there's a thing called quality of earnings report that you know. Uh, sure. What the quality of earnings report does is it looks at things like EBITDA and figures out an adjustment to it, which, which is more forward looking. It's very clear to me that th none of that is being done for the main asset of many of these companies, which is the customer. That's right. We, I asked them questions about, how do you look at that asset, the customer asset? And they're like, oh yeah, we'll look at lifetime value. I'm like, all right, let's dig into that deeper. How do you look at lifetime value? So what I found out was that most firms today look at lifetime value in a historical and top-down approach, which means they'll take what you said, hey, they'll take averages and they find that they're, they don't look into the, even the fact that there's no average customer. And it was fascinating to me that when you go from a top-down historical to a bottoms-up forward-looking lifetime value, there's such a huge opportunity to segment your customers because now you can make nuanced decisions around, hey, this customer group that is a certain type of a customer or bought certain products is no longer a forward-looking uh, you know, customer base that we're going to pursue. And that fundamentally changes what my LTV to CAC ratio looks like. And if you're going to eventually look at that as a big factor in the valuation of the business, then this adjusted LTV number is an LTV to CAC ratio is probably a lot better representation of what your business's value might truly be. Uh, so that, that was one key takeaway uh, that reminds me with the segmentation of the customer. And we've seen this again and again, almost every business we run a quality of customer report with will typically find that there is a large chunk of customers that is one and done, but not a represent, not a true representation of the future of the business. And when you look at that smaller group that is the core customer set, you see multiple times higher LTV to CAC ratios. And then the strategy the conversation of like, hey, let's go after that customer and lookalikes of those customers going forward might result in a much better outcome for the business. Uh, yeah. which, it could be a difficult question, a difficult conversation, because it goes to that, this one question that is posted here by Alyssa, which is, uh, or by Kushal, that is uh, retaining customers or sacrificing user growth for expansion, which is growth, similar to the growth versus profitability question that you mentioned, Anthony. Yeah, so uh, you're, you're bringing up some some very topical points, Ahmad. Um you know, in, in one of our companies, uh, you know, we kind of went through a somewhat of a traditional uh, process and we didn't have access to the kind of data that we wanted early on in, in talking to the company. Um, but, uh, but once we had the chance to do our analytics, we could see that the quality of the customer was improving and improving dramatically. And so we actually went up in value uh, versus our initial bid uh, by uh, 50%. Wow. So, um, so th there's some pretty dramatic, uh, you know, value swings that can happen if you can prove with predictive analytics that, um, you know, good stuff is happening. And it's probably worth pausing here a little bit on why predictive analytics versus uh, look, just looking at uh, historical cohort behavior. Uh, what we always tell companies is uh, starting with uh, historical cohort behavior is uh, an incredibly important thing. 
and glad that you're you're looking at it that way. But <clears throat> uh, predictive is important because one, for a rapidly growing company, your largest cohorts are almost always your most recent cohorts where you have the least amount of data. And so yeah. you can't have visibility on what's uh, what's likely going to happen there without doing uh, predictive analytics. Most companies don't have two years to wait around, see what happens with their recent cohorts, and then make decisions around what to do next. Um, we're moving in a pretty rapid environment. So if you want to be able to move along with what's happening in your business, then <clears throat> you almost have to use predictive to, to have a clear windshield. Um, the second part is, is that most of the time that we're getting involved with businesses, we like the growth stage because we call it the awkward, gangly adolescent phase of a brand. Uh, again, kind of going back to the organic nature of what, <clears throat> what brands uh, often are. Um, they're often going through some pretty meaningful uh, you know, shifts in the business, like expanding their product offering and uh, things of that nature or uh, starting to expand into other channels. And as you do that, <clears throat> um, you know, oftentimes you'll see that your cohort behavior is also starting to change along with it. So, uh, and you most often only have early signals of that, um, but having, doing it in a disciplined way with predictive analytics that's statistically rigorous <clears throat> um, can give you a high degree of confidence that you're making the right decisions, even on early reads on data. So <clears throat> that's why we like to use predictive analytics because uh, you just can't wait around to see what happens uh, for a good couple of years to see what the, the long-term historical cohort behavior looks like. Yeah, that, that makes sense. There's another question here from Melissa that goes back to our psychographic. So do you have recommendation reference resource for psychographic types? Yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of uh, external databases that are, are available there. There's four large data co-ops that all provide some degree of, you know, uh, customer segmentation work uh, from a psychographic perspective. Um, you know, you probably heard of Prism Claritas or Experian Mosaic. Uh, there's a couple others uh, out there. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, but in our view, I think one of the most, to, to us, it doesn't really matter which one you use that it depends on what, what the end purpose is and what you want out of it. Um, but to me, the interesting part is all these large data houses have done the same exercise statistically um, without boring people to death. It's called K-means clustering to try to group uh, mm -hmm. you know, birds of a feather that flock together and lump them into uh, you know, meaningful groups. And the answer from all four data houses is somewhere between 60 to about 70 different household types. Is it exactly 70? Is it exactly 60? None of them is perfectly correct, but directionally, they're all coming up with a very similar answer. And, um, and so uh, what you'll often see from these kinds of things is gender, age, income, education, political lean, uh, things of that nature, where you can have a lot of signals about, you know, what kind of end consumer you're resonating with. Urban, suburban, um, children, no children. Uh, you, you can start to, to see certain patterns evolve. So um, by hook or crook, most of our brands have a very progressive customer base. It's not always the case, uh, but uh, just as yeah. happenstance, we, we definitely see that in people's voting behavior with our brands. And we've, uh, we've seen this, I just want to add to this, is we've seen this uh, happen where, um, you know, we, when we do the segmentation or personas, what we call our personas product, we blend not only the third party data, but also like the first party data, like in terms of customers who are buying XYZ product while, uh, and they have attributes that are household attributes. Are they like brand loyalists? Are they, uh, do they, do they, and again, like the location, gender, like that stuff is also very age. Those are very ba the basic things that we combine with that to develop some personas that are very relevant 
to the brand, but also append customer lifetime value to it. So then you can say, hey, that's right. each persona then is correlated with some lifetime value and you can very quickly identify which persona is really, really stand out. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And we definitely see that certain household types are, are definitely more adventurous with trying out up and coming challenger brands versus more traditional brands. So all of these things, uh, they absolutely matter. And uh, ultimately it comes down to, again, defining that core customer, both from a quantitative and a qualitative perspective. We call that process defining your tribe and their behavior. And once you know who your tribe is uh, with a great deal of accuracy, then you can have a very channel specific strategy. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Why don't we, um, I, I know we're a little bit uh, running behind schedule, but let's uh, move on to our next topic, which I want to, let's come back to the, this topic, but I want to talk about um, metrics. So uh, one of the, the few metrics that jump out as we've done this quality of customer report is uh, have been percentage of customers that are profitable or unprofitable, lifetime unprofitable, LTV to CAC ratio and how it is trending over time, uh, payback periods uh, for different customers, uh, value concentration, or as you mentioned, the Pareto principle and retention uh, rates, uh, one anywhere from one month to 24 month retention rates. Those seem to be the one that, ones that jump out to us all the time as we're doing these quality of customer reports. Uh, what are some of the ones that jump out at you and like how else do you cut these metrics that tend to be the way that you're seeing out there as you're evaluating companies? Yeah, so <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is always a fun one because uh, one of the questions we always get asked by companies uh, when we first start talking with them um, is, what do you guys care more about, growth or profitability? And we always laugh and we say, well, both. Um, and for the right kinds of businesses, they're, they're actually just two sides of the same coin. So <clears throat> we care about uh, not one outcome, but what we care about is how are we balancing the trade-offs between growth and profitability as, as we try to scale. So, um, so that's the first thing I would say is uh, I, we are very much not believers that brand um, you know, should be all one or all the other. It's not all about growth. It's not all about profitability today especially at the growth stage where you're trying to um, you know, go from being a super high growth company at small scale to a more mature company with uh, more profitability, you have to manage that transition uh, properly. And the best way to do that in our view is uh, have everything be ROI based. And when we talk about ROI, uh, we also frequently get asked the question, do you guys care more about ROAS? <clears throat> or do you guys care more about LTV to CAC? And I say, well, it depends on what kind of business you are <laughs> and at what stage you are. So uh, if you're an early stage company and you just don't have much historical data on purchasing behavior, you're probably better off looking at ROAS uh, to, until you start to see material uh, you know, transaction behavior over time. Um, once you determine that you have strong customer loyalty, then you can start making LTV to CAC kinds of decisions, which can be a little bit, uh, you can make it be a, a longer tenured uh, ROI investment decision as opposed to an immediate payback. So, um, so yeah, we have no arbitrary metrics uh, that we have to see there. Um, what I would tell you is we've, we've never done a deal that has an LTV to CAC lower than two. Because um, I think you're just going to be on a pretty hard treadmill if, uh, uh, depending upon the kind of business you are. Yeah. Uh, um, so it doesn't have to be at a particular arbitrary metric like that. The other thing we, we like to talk about quite a bit is, um, you know, what's the potential to increase LTV by what you're doing? So not just taking that ratio as fixed, but what can you do to shift the outcome on LTV and re, uh, particularly through retention? And, um, but most people want to focus the conversation around the CAC and uh, you know, presenting to us how low the CACs are. 
And low CACs can be good. Um, and usually it means that there's some kind of strong resonance there. But again, we don't look at just the average CAC. We also like to look at what the marginal CAC is. Because with mm -hmm. marginal dollar you're spending, not the, you don't spend the average dollar, you invest the capital to spend the marginal dollar. And what the, the marginal CAC is, is uh, equally, uh, if not more important to us. So, um, so we don't have any arbitrary metrics like LTV to CAC must be 3X plus uh, or things of that nature. Uh, it really depends yeah. on the shape of customer retention. And the more retention yeah. you have, the more flexibility you have to make some of those decisions. Well, since uh, I have uh, seen this data for hundreds of data sets, let me kind of share some insights with the audience of what, I, what we get to see most often. So prof percentage of uh, unprofitability, uh, we tend to see that for most businesses, especially D2C businesses that are non-subscription, uh, we or even mixed subscription, What's, what was fascinating, and this is true back all the way back, going back to my PayPal days and to even now, we see that about 30 to 50 percent of a customer of a company's customer base tends to be lifetime unprofitable. Mm -hmm. And that's really like fascinating to me that the outliers are driving the business so much that you could get away with having a 50 percent unprofitable base and you're still surviving and thriving as a business. Um, goodness looks like when you're a sub, like for every company that we've helped with uh, during M&A process or uh, they've gotten to a point where they're doing a capital raise, they've figured out their customer base where their, their cohorts are now less than 5% unprofitable, uh, but generally, you know, uh, 30 to 50 is not uh, out, of, out of this world. We've seen that happen quite often. Uh, similarly, on LTV to CAC ratio, Anthony, you mentioned you don't invest in below two. Uh, we see two uh, like below three is being like not great. You need to be above three for sure, and three to five is where most good companies are. D two C companies are targeting. We've done this for B two B SaaS companies. Um, their LTV to CAC ratios are generally above ten. They're like charging such high uh, you know margins that they're they're doing really really well on that side. So above ten, you're doing fantastic. But three to five tends to be like where normal uh, most like if i've just randomly picked one of the companies out of the hundreds we've looked at they're likely to find um payback periods if you're a subscription business like uh, that, that that you know as a ten dollar or a fifteen dollar subscription you're gonna have longer payback periods that are anywhere from three to six months if you're more of a let's say warby parker where your average order value is really really high you expect that to be zero uh, or the first you, you, first transaction profitable. Uh, value concentration, Anthony, you have a note, I think what was interesting is I, before we, we had looked at hundreds of databases, I had a conversation with you and you're like, yeah, we see, we see about 20% of the customer base bringing in how much uh, uh, revenue and value? 65% of the revenue typically. Yeah, it's, that one is so dead on. It's almost uncanny how often that is like, always are either 65 or right around that. Uh, we, we don't see a lot of uh, change there. And then another one that varies that I didn't list here is retention, like one month retention, 12 month retention. And that varies based on if you're a subscription business or a non-subscription or a mixed business. So we, we see that quite a bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and on that point, uh, I think it's worth noting that I think people have gotten the joke in software businesses uh, over the last 10, 15 years that, um, you know, the reason why they've uh, become highly valued over time is that they can have incredible retention metrics. Well, um, consumer businesses aren't generally going to approach the same level of retention that you, you see in SaaS businesses, but in terms of being able to predict it, you can now have you know, 90 to 95% of the visibility of a SaaS business that you can have that in a consumer business. And where I think uh, the market has been somewhat led astray recently is I think being able to scale a business with low CACs has gotten somewhat overvalued and retention is undervalued. But retention is, that's the magic that helps you uh, keep going uh, and growing uh, with both um, you know, revenue scale and profitability over time.
And so, you know, what we typically end up having conversations with folks is, you know, what are the, what's the nature of the retention? Why is it what it is? Is it what it is? How can it be better? And sometimes it's as simple as uh, inventory. And, you know, uh, uh, sometimes we see that there's clear demand for a company's products and people are dying to buy from the company, but they're chronically out of stock of what they want to buy. Mm -hmm. so artificially truncating their best customer's behavior, which uh, as we've talked about for the reasons that the Pareto principle, the 65, 20 rule, you're leaving a lot of money on the table by doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and we've, we've seen that behavior with one of our customers recently, and it's, it's fascinating what that does to like the whole cohort if they're missing out, like inventory didn't make it to, uh, and they're shipping late because yeah. of that. Um, awesome, well, there's a few questions here uh, we, should, we should quickly cover. So Evan is asking, what do you see most important drivers of lifetime value? Are formal loyalty programs needed or are there more simple lower investment options that can achieve similar results? Uh, I'd love your answer, and then I, I can share my thoughts on this as well. Yeah, so I think the, the best models that we've seen over time are, are not forced loyalty, uh, where <clears throat> certain categories are very natural subscription categories, and, uh, uh, but trying to force our, uh, retention through artificial, uh, artificially harsh retention metrics uh, is not something we espouse. But where uh, instead of having a subscription program for certain companies, the right answer is having a loyalty program that's not built on points, but uh, or just cash back refunds or things of that nature, but uh, really incentivizing uh, that loyal audience to keep coming back. And so there's lots of different ways to make it fun and engaging without just giving away money to do it. Um, so that's the way we, we steer most brands is stay away from cash back payment kind of programs, but give people a reason to come back um, and uh, have it be fun, authentic and engaging. And, um, and when you have flexibility around that, then, um, then you, that's what we often see the, the most incredible retention. Um, and I'll, you know, I can give one example, like Miendi's um, you know, has incredible customer loyalty among its membership base. And the membership base is, you know, a significant portion of the, the customer base. And um, they, they have the highest customer loyalty of anything we've ever seen in terms of repeat purchasing behavior. Um, but built into the DNA of that brand is there's a reason why people keep coming back and um, they have frequent new print drops that people go crazy about. And it doesn't mean the print new print mm. is for everyone, but for some sub sub segment of uh, that loyal customer base, um, they just go fanatical about it. And so yeah. that, that's pretty authentic to the brand, how it's been built up over time. Um, it's a pretty flexible, you know, it's a subscription, but it really acts like a membership program and a loyalty program, uh, much more so than a, a traditional subscription. And that flexibility of the program also gives people a lot of trust in the company. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, and <clears throat> one thing I, I'll, I'll note there is that this is, not, this is not a hard and fast number that we can attest to, but directionally it feels like the number of consumers in the US that actually prefer to buy by subscription is feels like it's around one seventh of the total population. Hmm. So, um, so if you try too hard to make your business a subscription just for the predictability of it, you're probably actually truncating your overall market size. So giving people the flexibility, uh, you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, where uh, you can give people the choice to consume that way, but still allow people to purchase a la carte um, and not artificially truncate the size of your market. This is such a loaded question for me, Anthony, because I have, I have like six different variations of like what I've seen. Uh, but one thing that 
stands out that I think you mentioned is product and brand, like is the biggest driver of, of lifetime value. And the example, um, you know, is even a, a simple thing as like a hair gel. Like if I buy, even if I bought it from Amazon or a brand, I'm going to, as soon as I'm close to running out of it, if I really like the product, I'm going to keep buying that. It's not, it's not, and gross and, and uh, CPG firms have really figured this out. They didn't have this measurement of lifetime value, but they've just done it. They have had to do it purely through product. And the second thing is targeting the right product. So let's say I've built the right product. I'm, I've built a you know product that I'm selling men's hair gel, but I'm targeting broad targeting to both women and men. I'm like wasting a ton of my dollars and you might even get some women to purchase it for their spouses, but it's not a good use of your marketing dollars. So product, targeting the right customer, bringing the right customer in the door. And then we see a bunch of like retention and like long tail metrics. And in the long tail metrics, you know, a, a few telling uh, drivers tend to be, did the customer come in to purchase it for themselves? Or they are they buying a gift? Are they, you did they use a promotion? If so, how deep of a promotion? Did they buy multiple products together or not? Uh, those things are a combination of those things can be generally really, really valuable uh, as understand building even into your model of customer lifetime value, predictive customer lifetime value is what we've seen. Um, but I think that's a very good question. And there, there are lots of deeper uh, conversations we could have because the other part of the question is what options can you deploy? Right. And, and, you know, my, my, observation has been that the best option is better custom, better product and better customer acquisition to begin with. And then you can have some of the loyalty programs that can help drive on top of that. But if you get the first two parts wrong, you're going to be in a struggle on the loyalty side. It's, it's not like you could sell a crappy product and then try to get people to uh, their first impression with the brand matters a lot. hundred percent. Yeah. And there, there's some, there's some interesting findings we always find when companies want to share um, you know, additional data with us uh, uh, down to the product level. So, um, <clears throat> for example, in Marine Layer, one of the things we noticed was that, you know, their highest lifetime value male customers, oftentimes their product of first purchase was the t-shirt, which was their original hero mm -hmm. product. And yeah. counterintuitive because the t-shirt is actually the, one of the lower AOV items that they have. Uh, or the uh, lower ticket items that they have. So if you're just measuring it on a first transaction, you might steer yourself wrong. Uh, yeah. but, you know, people that the t-shirt is almost like the gateway drug to the, the rest of the brand. And um, people who fall in love with the t-shirt then often buy uh, a lot more from the company. And yeah. But you wouldn't necessarily know that from just looking at what the first transaction would look like. Um, so there's there's some uh, other interesting dynamics that we've seen in uh, Miendis that way. We've seen that in Dagny Dover. Um, and uh, I don't want to go into too much detail and give away uh, the company's secret sauce that way. But um, looking at it from a product level and you know that behavior when the customers first engaging with you can tell you quite a bit. And again, it's, it's hard to do without predictive analytics. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Let's, uh, let's do this. I'm looking at the time and we only, we're over our time and maybe we'll go to the top of the hour. Let's jump into the Q and a section, Anthony, if uh, you don't mind, we'll skip uh, some of the other prepared questions, but let's do some Q and a, uh, there's plenty of questions here that we haven't gotten to. So maybe, uh, if, if, Folks uh, on who are listening in, uh, you can type in your any additional questions in the Q and A section. But we'll start to try to go through some of these. Um, let's go into uh, the the question I'm seeing is when calculating lifetime value, is it based on gross revenue minus COGS net revenue or something else? I'd love your answer, and then I can share share uh, my thoughts on this as well. Yeah. So if we want to get really specific, uh, we look at it on what we call a shipped margin basis. So shipped margin to us is a shorthand way of saying uh, contribution margin before marketing spend. So uh, so that's taking in your product costs, your, um, you know, your pick pack and shipping, um, variable credit card, all, all the truly variable costs. Uh, and looking at lifetime value of that profit 
versus what you had to invest to, to get it. The gross versus net revenue question is a good one because uh, we, we have this uh, conversation all the time with brands. When we look at net revenue, not only do we look at netting out the typical things like um, you know, discounts and, and returns, but from a transaction level, we will actually zero out full return transactions and not make them count. So, um, it because it, it, it's an important input into the predictive analytics. So um, that's the way we choose to do it. Uh, but I love to hear how you guys do it, Emma. If there's uh, I, was, I couldn't agree with you more. That's exactly how we do it. So that, that I don't have anything else to add to that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, awesome. Let's go to the next one uh, from Melissa. Would you elaborate on the formula or equation framework for value use and val value concentration. So value concentration, uh, I'll just share from our, our perspective. What we do is we take, imagine you have your, um, you have a table of customer IDs and the value they're bringing. You sort that table from lowest to the highest value and then assign a percentage as a, uh, as a, as a, as a function of customers. So let's say you have hundred customers, each customer gets 1% and, and all the way one, all the way to hundred and then value you compute value as a percentage of total or total value. And then you have a scatter plot or not a scatter plot, but a line plot that is zero to hundred percent of the customers and zero to hundred percent of revenue or zero to hundred percent of value. And that's how you kind of plot out the, the, the value concentration curve. Um, and I'm happy to share, like we have a couple of blogs about this, but Anthony, anything else to add to this, how, how you cal calculate value concentration? Yeah, so, so we, we like to show it that way. Uh, lots of times we'll plot out a map that we, we affectionately call our, uh, our paint chip chart. So it just looks like a bunch of different colored tiles with the value of the company, you know, segmented by one time customers, two times, three times, four times, et cetera. So you can see uh, pr it's pretty impactful visually when you see, um, you know, uh, high value customers, uh, even if they're a minority of the overall customer base, you know, what percentage of the overall value they're driving. The other thing we like to show brands is um, show them that if you do, uh, you know, just kind of what you would typically expect to be a bell curve distribution and plot out high value to low value, you'll see that it is not a bell curve. It is a very skewed distribution where uh, you'll have, a, the hump will be at, you know, you have a lot of low value customers. And then you have this extremely long tail of high value customers, hopefully. And so when you look at the average lifetime value, what you'll see is it sits in no man's land. It doesn't reflect the value of the majority of your customers, um, but it also doesn't reflect the, the value of your high customers. And really when you're looking at a business that way that has customer loyalty, you'll almost always see that dynamic where uh, if you're managing your business solely to the average lifetime value, you'll see you're managing your business to no man's land. So you really have to think about, to uh, Imad's point, minimizing the losses on your low value customers, but also showing the love to the high value customers. It's really a bifurcated strategy. I wanted to share a shameless plug. So if you guys ever Google the terms quality of customer report, um, this will take you to a, a, a page which has a sample report and actually shows you what some of these plots might look like. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, just a sample data set that we use, but I wanted to kind of have you guys uh, be able to take a look at it. So value concentration is one of the, so first one, uh, this is the one that you were mentioning, which is you don't, you expect a bell shape for your lifetime value distribution and it's not. Um, and the second one is the sales concentration one. And you can actually go and look at what this chart looks like and we even list out the general methodology for it. So you'll, you'll be able to kind of see how to think about these if you're impl trying to implement some sort of a BI system to get and this going. I can see a mod that magically for Wayfair, 20% of their customers are generating 65% of their revenue. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and this is, I, I can't tell you how often I'm just amazed by how accurate that is. Yeah. Um, awesome. Let's go to the next question, which is do capital investors value subscription businesses higher? I think you kind of answered that, that you look at it in a nuanced way, but I want to hear your thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I think uh, the answer is yes, if it makes sense for that category. Um, if it doesn't make sense for the category, then you you may be dinged for it because what you'll probably end up showing is that you're you're on a pretty rapid treadmill and burning out customers. And uh, what's incredibly important for us in looking at subscription type businesses, uh, and I say subscription type because MeUndies is a quasi subscription, but it's not the only mm -hmm. way um, that people engage with the brand. Um, to me, you know, if if you show that customers once they cancel they never come back it's a pretty big ding against the business and um, again this is where i'd say you know offering flexibility is incredibly important not just to increase the aggregate size of the market that's relevant for you um, but if you're too hardcore about trying to trap people into a subscription uh, they will never trust you and they just won't come back again so, and ultimately that's limiting your overall potential. I think sophisticated investors understand that. Um, and again, I'm pretty biased, but I feel like you don't need a subscription to have visibility in your business. That's what predictive analytics allows you to do. Um, <clears throat> you know, subscription businesses do tend to be slightly more predictable than transactional businesses, but not by much if you're using the right predictive techniques. Yeah, no, I, I think I wanted to one last piece of insight I wanted to share, and I know we're kind of out of time, so I'll, I'll answer this and then let's uh, close it out. Uh, and anybody, all the remaining questions, please send them directly to myself or Anthony. We're happy to kind of jump jump on a call and answer. And anybody who's looking to do lifetime value calculations, please reach out. One thing I wanted to mention about the subscription nature of the business, we've looked at many subscription nature businesses. And one of the most interesting things we found is that we've seen customers cancel subscriptions and come back over and over again. They use the cancellation as a pausing behavior just because the company is not giving them the flexibility to do that. And what's amazing is that these brands are not even thinking about it that way. They think about somebody canceling a subscription as this customer has left the brand and it's most often not the case. How often not the case? About 37% of the times we've seen that these customers will come back just at their own cadence which is fascinating to me uh, along what you're mentioning. Yep. That, that's how much they want the flexibility. Yep. <clears throat> All right, uh, well, Anthony, this was a fascinating conversation. I, I can't tell you how, uh, uh, how insightful I find the, every conversation I have with you because you've had a look at this for so long and uh, it, it's, it, it was really great to have this conversation. Uh, I am, I can, I'm sure that all, with all the Q and A's that we got, I, I, I know I can feel that the attendees felt that as well. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, joining. And uh, if anybody has any questions, as I mentioned, please reach out to Anthony directly or myself. Uh, happy to quickly jump on a call and, and um, share more. Uh, this is a super fascinating nerdy topic for I think both of us and we love nerding out on this and happy to do that more. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ahmad. I always enjoy our conversation. So looking forward to more. Likewise, have a good one. Take care. Thanks.